welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Midweek Supplemental. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. Coming up, James Brand and Riot team up to make what looks to be a pretty incredible integral knife. Uh, my Leatherman Surge literally falls apart through lack of use. And we take a look at some custom and production fixed blade knives on loan from tier one gear reviews. But before we get to all of that, it's my first opportunity to show off my knives. And uh, if this were a radio show, you'd hear a little audio sting that would go something like, knife check or something like that. And we're back in, ladies and gentlemen, with a pocket check. And today, I'm breaking one of my cardinal rules. Yes, that's right. I'm carrying two knives of the same blade shape. And uh, I know what you're thinking. Uh, you're thinking, Bob, with the world falling apart around us, you're you're carrying two of the same, same blades. Like That's a cardinal rule, isn't it? Have you lost your compass? And uh, I guess I'm, I'm still susceptible to the insanity around us. And today I'm carrying two clip point blades. Please don't be disappointed. Please don't tune out. They're excellent knives. And I do have a third one to balance it out of a different blade shapes. Uh, but first in my front right pocket is the beautiful Emerson Appalachian. Look at this thing. Such a great knife. This is uh, one of the more recent designs from Emerson uh, in the last five years or so. And this one has the um, the the single detent, uh, the original um, the original Emersons uh, came with two detents, one to kind of hold the knife in that was located right up here, and then the main detent on the lock bar. In the past five years, they have moved uh, wisely so, I'd say, to a single detent. I say wisely so because it offers an action that most knife people these days really like. You know, you can flick it out as opposed to being forced to either wave it out or slow roll it out. Now, I am not partial to either to either style. I have about half of my Emerson collection has the double detent and half of the uh, collection has the single detent. I love them both for different reasons, but um, this Appalachian I'm incredibly fond of. Uh, I got this one from uh, Slicey Dicey. He, he bought it to check out Emerson's and then went to sell it. And uh, he knew who to come to first. He gave me the right of first refusal and I snatched it up. Um, I really, uh, I haven't been carrying my Emerson's in the last couple of weeks because I've had a few new things come in like the um, like the 8020. Uh, but yesterday I took the opportunity to put this MXG gear deep carry clip on this knife because this is one of those Emerson's that rides audaciously high in the pocket. And maybe that's one of the reasons I wasn't carrying this as much uh, as I carry uh, other Emerson's. So I put this deep carry pocket clip on and I do love it and it still leaves enough out of the pocket to draw easily. I say draw because, you know, I'm always getting in knife altercations and I have to draw my knife, not just pull it out and open it, but draw it. Uh, so yes, uh, it's waivable, of course, and um, Emerson, they just came out with a new one that uh, is non-waved, and I always think it's interesting when they come out with a non-waved Emerson because uh, it still looks just like an Emerson, except minus the wave. It looks kind of naked, I got to say. Um, but our good friend Edwin has already posted his pictures of it, and I'm sure he's got three or four by now. Uh, next in my pocket is the beautiful clip point blade. This is the Lion Steel Gitano. I don't know if you're old enough to remember this, but there used to be a, uh, a designer jean company in the 80s uh, when designer jeans were hot called Gitano. So every time I open this up or carry this, I think of those old, uh, they were a real thing. At least when I was a kid, I remember watching these, uh, um, you know, Brooke Shields doing Calvin Klein and, and Gloria Vanderbilt and all these, uh, all these uh, designer jeans with, you know, with close up pictures of Tukas's walking around in, in designer jeans. Anyway, this is different. This is the, this is a knife. Okay. And so I'm going to get back on topic here. This is a beautiful clip point. Uh, made in Italy by Lion Steel. And as you can see, it sort of mimics or takes a lot of design cues from the classic Spanish folding knife, the Navaja. Um, and that was really what drew me to this. Uh, plus, it just has really incredible walk and talk. So if as you open and close it, it 
has a very strong spring. It's easy to pull out. It's easy to to uh, open the blade. Um, Lion steels and uh, and fox seem to have this way of making uh, slip joints that open up easily and close with uh, requiring more strength, which is something I really like. You know, that's kind of the way you want it. You don't want it in reverse. <laughs> you don't want it hard to open and uh, difficult to close. Uh, I mean, hard to open and easy to close because it doesn't have a lock. So you wanna be somewhat careful. Uh, even though these are two clip point blades, they are diff very different types of clip point blades. And so that's my excuse. And uh, let me see if I can, there, turn the light down just a little bit because uh, these are very reflective knives and I don't want them to, to flare up in the camera. The third knife I'm carrying is a fixed blade. And um, I'm carrying this because A, it carries well, especially with the sheath I made for it. And B, I wanna get another one and I want to customize it. I'll show you how. I'm carrying the Cold Steel Roach Belly. Cold Steel Roach Belly is in their line of very inexpensive outdoor knives. Uh, this one I bought it was 12 bucks. Uh, they've gone up to a whopping $16, oh my gosh. Uh, but still, it is a fantastic knife. Uh, I'll, this is my sheath, as I mentioned. So the sheath that comes with is a little different. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the Roach Belly, um, I love the shape. It's a traditional um, uh, American shape for hunting and trapping, that kind of thing. You can tell from the musket that they put on the billboard here. But uh, this knife comes with a, an incredible endorsement. Uh, a, a friend of, a, no, a cousin of a friend years ago when I was living in New York was coming through New York City and he stayed uh, with our neighbor and we were talking about knives. Now this guy was spending, he was about a year into this, you know, finding himself journey uh, sort of thing where he was camping out and just kind of bumming around the country. And uh, this was the one knife he had with him uh, when he told me, when I told him I love cold steel knives and that I was a knife collector, he lit up and he said, I have a cold steel. And then I lit up. Oh, what does he have? You know, this guy's camping, living, living off the land. I figured he'd have some, you know, an SRK or a trail master or something, uh, you know, more expensive, beefy and glamorous uh, in the lineup uh, that cold steel had to offer at the time. And he pulled out the roach belly and he's, he swore by this knife. It's got uh, at least this version of it. This is an older one. Has uh, is made in Taiwan and sports uh, Krupp's uh, steel, uh, German Krupp steel, forty-one sixteen, I think it was. And um, so he said he used it for everything, and it just it did great. And he didn't really sharpen it, so uh, it keeps a great edge for a soft and inexpensive steel. Uh, with this uh, model, I um, with this specific specimen here, I put some grooves in it to make the handle less smooth and uh, works great. Um, and it being a 12 now $16 knife, I wasn't afraid to, to do some alterations to it. One thing I like about this knife, uh, which lives in the car in the center console, console of my car, but what I do like about it uh, when carrying it is that the, the handle is relatively short and it's rounded off. So if, I, if I'm carrying it in the waistband at say that three o'clock uh, position, it, it doesn't jab into my ribs, it's not uncomfortable, and it's short enough that you can sit and drive with it and barely, uh, barely know that it's there. As you can see, it's got a great little uh, row of jimping up here that is quite effective. And um, so I'm carrying this because I would like to get another one and put a second edge on it, sharpen this back edge. Um, I, I know that I have to be careful when I do it because I don't want it to overheat. I don't want to, I don't want to trash the heat treat on the blade. So I'm going to have to be, uh, it's going to take a while. Probably. I do not have a machine. Um, I do not have a grinder whose speed I can control. So, you know, I'll have to, I'll have to do a pass, put it in some water, cool it down, do a pass, do it, in, you know, and just over and over be making sure that I'm not, uh, overheating it and and knocking out the the heat treat but i'm really interested in seeing what this would be like with a double edge i know it will shorten the blade a little bit um because you know just just by removing material all the way up to the tip it will take some of that material you know off the tip and uh, i suspect with my skills it will <laughs> probably radically change uh the profile of this thing but i'm very interested in this shape as a double edge 
So I'm just going to go for it. So today I've been carrying it around. I just want to see if it's something that's worth the effort. It's it's worth the money because it's not very much money, but I want to see if it's worth the effort um, to do and, and if it's comfortable for me to carry around. Uh, this is the sheath I made for it. Uh, it is a Kydex uh, sheath. I think this is 0 0.06 Kydex, and it's a pancake. I usually don't make pancake sheaths. I prefer the taco style, but this one... Um, was one of my very first. I got this knife to practice making Kydex sheaths. And um, I don't have a clip on it. I have paracord and it works great. You can you can kind of slide it on your belt scout style or you know how I like it in the waistband. So I have this little tension clip here so that I can uh, lengthen the string if need be um, and use it like debt cord or, or what have you. So a very interesting knife. I, this is a design I would love to see Cold Steel uh, beef up in terms of their steel choice and uh, handle material, but keep it thin like this. It's a nice thin knife. Uh, I love the design. I think it would be great to see it in a sort of a higher end iteration. So that's my pocket check for the day. What are you carrying? Of course, always want to know what you're carrying. You can call the listener line. Uh, 724-466-4487 and let us know what you're carrying. It's always interesting to me or drop a comment down in the comment section. Um, it'll be, it's funny, like throughout the week, I'll get a little, uh, a little comment thing that pops up and it'll just be a knife. It'll, it'll be someone typing in because they hear this part and they're like, oh, I'll let you know what I'm carrying. So it'll just come up bench made. <laughs> like, oh, so I love that. So let me know what you're carrying. Uh, it's interesting to me. 724-466-4487. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of new uh, knives out in the uh, in the in the world of knives. As I mentioned up top, James Brand has something that I really, really would like to have, and you don't hear me say that often. Uh, but first, uh, I'd like to ask you to help support the show if you can, or if you if you have the druthers uh, by going to Patreon. You get knife junkie stickers. You get mentioned on the podcast uh, once a month or once uh, in that first month. You have early access to the Sunday interview and midweek supplemental shows without ads. Uh, also, we do monthly knife giveaways every month, which is a lot of fun. And we're cooking up a few new exciting exclusive opportunities that will uh, will will bring you into the picture even more. Um, so your support really helps and it's greatly appreciated. So check us out on Patreon and see what helping us gets you. The quickest way to do that is by going to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. So as I remove my EDC, my, well, I guess it's not my EDC, it's my today carry. So TC, I'm going to uh, bring out this knife that, uh, you know, I'm trying to find every excuse to show off. It's my Demco 8020. I'm going to hold it under the knife cam so you can gaze upon its beauty while I start this next, uh, this next story. So this is something we talked a little bit about on Thursday Night Knives. Uh, Andrew Demco and Demco Knives is now coming out with their first production knife under that shingle, under the Demco Knives uh, name. Um, you know, as you know, Andrew Demco designed many, many knives for Cold Steel. And now that his partnership with Cold Steel has come to its end, uh, he and his brother John have wisely decided to come out with their own production uh, line of knives. These are made in Taiwan. I'm not sure who the manufacturer is, but they're starting with the uh, with the vaunted AD20. Uh, they have had such crazy success with this knife uh, that, that, you know, they just cannot, you know, they make them, they sell out immediately. Uh, it took me a year to get one. Um, and so uh, other people who've had their ear to the ground have gotten theirs quicker. But my point is the demand is very high and, uh, you know, it takes, takes some time to make them. So being smart guys, uh, they decided to do a production run. I think Taiwan is the way to go because uh, um, we know from Spyderco, there are some incredible Taiwanese knife making companies, uh, manufacturers out there. So it's the AD20.5. It's a smaller version of the AD20. The AD20 has a 3.6 inch blade. These have... Um, three uh, three inch blades and as you can see they offer a clip point and a worn cliff 
And I got to say, when I first saw that Warren Cliff, to be 100% honest, I did not uh, care for it. But the more I look at it, the more I love it. You know me, I love Warren Cliffs, and I get uh, I get very particular about uh, the the way certain blade shapes are, are are turned material. I think they did a great job with this now. At first, I thought it needed to be pointier, but in, in examining it, it's pointy enough. And um, so anyway, they are featuring the newest of his lock innovations, the shark lock. Uh, if you don't know, Andrew Demko has, in, you know, he's innovated quite a few number of locks. Uh, the triad, which is considered the strongest lock in the industry, and it is damn strong. Uh, I think that is now property of, uh, I could be mistaken though, of uh, cold steel because they're still using it. And then the scorpion lock featured on the AD-15. And then there was the uh, that plunge lock, I think they called it, on the um, outdoorsman. And then this, the shark lock, is sort of a evolution of that style of, of knife. Uh, it's not a plunge lock. It's a, um, uh, well, you let me know. Well, what am I missing here? But it's the same sort of, it's like a wedge. And uh, so they're featuring that in this, uh, the Demco 20.5. It is a very, very strong lock, and it being right here, I'll put this under the knife cam, it being right here on the uh, back side of the handle, one would think that it gets in the way, like sometimes a secondary lock that's placed there does. It does not. In this case, in saber grip, it works as an excellent thumb ramp, thumb ramp or in a hammer style grip with the thumb on the back of the blade, but using that excellent jimping, uh, it's you don't even feel it. So he really did a great job in designing this thing to be in a great and convenient spot, totally ambidextrous spot, um, while at the same time, it does not interfere with your grip. Even in reverse grip, if heaven forbid you need to use reverse grip, you're not going to feel it. So they are using that wisely on the new AD 20.5s, and um, I think that it is a it's one of those locks kind of like the Axis style lock or the um, compression lock from Spyderco. It is fidget friendly, but also very, very strong. So I'm very excited to see uh, that Demco Knives is putting out production knives as well as the knives they uh, they put out of their shop in Pennsylvania, Wampum, Pennsylvania. And um, I look forward to seeing what other knives down the line they produce in this production fashion. I'm looking forward to getting my hands on that little, uh, that little Warren cliff, by the way, I say little cause it's three inches, but Hey, I'll do that for a Demco. I'll go to three inches. Okay. Next up James brand. Um, you know, I like to make fun of James brand because they're so cool. You know, their, their design, everything about their, their presentation is just cool, cool, cool as it gets, you know, kind of, kind of hip, very hip. And uh, I like to make fun of that for no real reason, um, uh, just because it's fun. But they do create a hell of a product. And uh, the past couple of knives that have come out have been these slip joints that I loved uh, looking at anyway and, and showed promise uh, in terms of, <laughs> in terms of um, I don't know, it just they look great and everything. Uh, but I never really uh, got myself behind the wheel of one. And then they came out with this damn thing, the Barnes. Oh my God, this is beautiful. It is a beautiful uh, three and a half inch bladed drop point knife made by Riot, and it's an integral. And my Lord, is it a beautiful looking integral, especially uh, when, you, when you look around the pommel area and the clip area, they really did a fantastic job designing this. And you know, if Riot is manufacturing it, it's a, it's a super high quality knife. Now, that's the great thing about using a company like Riot or We. You know that uh, if you like the design, you'll be happy with the knife because it's very, very, very rare that you get a, a lemon of a knife coming out of those factories. So it's exciting to see uh, the James brand coming out with the Barnes here. Uh, look at that. That's what I'm talking about. When you look at the pommel and the clip area, uh, the clip is integral integral to the handle and 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 the way the uh, I think uh, maybe that's a secondary piece but the way the the blade well terminates there is just so appealing it just really um well 
it takes the format of integral construction and 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 makes it very obvious when you look at it that it's one solid hunk of titanium. If you're wondering what integral means while I keep saying the word over and over, uh, if you're unfamiliar, it's instead of sculpting two handle slabs that you screw together and put the blade in between like a sandwich, you're taking one slab of titanium and carving out the blade well and 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 fitting all of the uh, works up up by the ricasso inside there without having two pieces that come together with a backspacer or standoffs. So the manufacturing of it is more complex, more, it takes more time. There's a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot of material waste in carving out that uh, excess titanium uh, where it doesn't need to be. And uh, in the design process, it's also uh, quite a challenge. So um, I think that is what justifies the $599 price tag of this, of this knife. Um, yeah, that's, that's the one part. I mean, but that's what you expect. Uh, when you buy an integral, it's going to be more expensive. And then you figure it's Riot made and it's James brand. So, you know, it's going to be a premium. You're going to be spending a lot of money on it, but look at this thing. It is beautiful. Uh, in the raw silver titanium handle, as you see right here and the uh, polished blade or the, um, uh, satin blade. It comes with a bright green thumb stud, which I find appealing. And then they have a um, black anodized handle also with the satin blade. And that has, I believe, a blue thumb stud. Um, so to me, this is a very appealing knife. And then the fact that it is a 3.5 inch knife, which is at the lower end of my preferred size range. Uh, it's making me a little sick because I think at some point I'm going to have to try and get my hands on one of these. Uh, NAF Sergeant just saw, got one of these and uh, incidentally used used a um, uh, a military discount to, to get it for a, a more reasonable price. And I think it was a GovX uh, membership discount, and which James Brand um, uh, honors. So he got the knife. Uh, he's got a video up. Check it out. Uh, the James Brand. Riot made integral folder called the Barnes. Hip name. Uh, next, I want to just uh, just a quick note. A German knife designer by the name of Helmut Yermer uh, has passed away. He's the gentleman who designed that uh, crazy looking real steel uh, lightweight slicer. There, um, it, it, to me, it looks like a scalpel, like a real, like a folding scalpel. And he's also responsible for a number of uh, award-winning knives made by Puma and by um, uh, um, some other um, companies. Jeez. Actually, Jim, would you scroll down? That would actually help. I'm, I'm having a little brain, uh, brain lock here. Um, yeah, there you go. So this knife is an award-winning knife. If you can't see it, it's a fixed blade Tanto that's very uh, highly designed, but also uh, very tactical and, and useful in the field. Uh, Helmut Yermer has passed away. And so, you know, just want to acknowledge that. Uh, we all know him most recently for that real steel, uh, real steel slicer knife. And uh, well, rest in peace, good sir. And uh, hopefully there, you're up there improving the knives and, uh, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to stop it right there. So rest in peace, Helmet Yermer. Coming up, we're going to take a look at my state of the collection, which has not grown, uh, but I do have some knives on loan from a friend. And also, uh, one of my things has, has bit the dust. And, uh, so I'm, I, I, I need to tell you about that. Um, but before we dig in, I want to make sure that you like comment, subscribe. If you've listened this far, it's keeping you uh, and hit the notification bell on YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, it really helps to let you know when we upload a new video because man, you don't want to be late on that. You want to see it as soon as it comes out and is hot on the presses. Also join us tomorrow night for Thursday night knives. It's our weekly live stream at 10 PM Eastern standard time. And uh, it is really fun. We have a really lively conversation, uh, not only with people in the comments, uh, but also people, coming on and joining the show. You know, when you go to the knifejunkie.com slash join and put the camera in front of your face, you can come right on. I can actually put a, a face to the name and 
we sit there and we talk. We talk knives. This last week was very lively. Every week is very lively. It's actually uh, one of one of the true highlights of my week. So join us 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube. That's for Thursday Night Knives. Uh, join us Thursday Night Knives. Junkies, are you looking for a new knife and want to save money too? Would you like to help support the Knife Junkie channel while saving money on that knife? Then check out our Knives for Sale page at www.thenifejunkie.com slash knives. Through our special affiliate relationships, we bring you weekly knife deals on lots of great knives. You save some money on your knife purchase, and we make a small commission. It's a win-win. So what are you waiting for? Check out the knife specials each and every week at www.thenifejunkie.com slash knives. That's thenifejunkie.com slash knives. You'll be glad you did. Again, for knife savings, visit thenifejunkie.com slash knives. I love that guy's voice. Uh, so next, state of the collection. Uh, I'm in the car, and I can't remember what I needed it for, but I reached for my Leatherman Surge. Uh, this thing is about 13 ounces of steel in, in a leather leather case here, and I bought it. I remember I bought two at once. Uh, maybe that was my indication that I could afford two at once. Maybe I shouldn't have uh, gotten it in the first place, but... I got them a few years back, put one in my backpack and uh, one in my car, and I needed the one in the car, and I opened it up, and I want to show you what, what happened. Um, this happened. Oh, these are the extra parts. All the extra parts came out. I don't know what happened to this, but my Leatherman Surge has just sort of spontaneously dis disassembled itself, and... Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what to do with it, you know, because it, I can still use it as pliers. So I'll keep it around, I guess. I can still use it for some of the functions, but but I don't trust it. Oh, boy, that's loud. I don't trust it. Uh, these pieces, this one, I think, looks like a, some sort of a tension spring. And this one, I'm, I'm not sure what that does, but they just fell out. And one of the pins uh, sort of disintegrated on me. So... Um, I, I've always known Leatherman to make some really, really excellent uh, uh, multi-tools. I, I have one that my brother got me at least 20 years ago, and it lives in the uh, junk drawer in the kitchen, gets used all the time, and um, has never failed. You know, But this one, it's I got it because it's so big and so beefy, and um, I thought it would just be stout till, till the end of time, but... Uh, it's not. So I want, if you know anything about Leatherman's, Leatherman multi-tools, or if you have any uh, sort of opinions on which are the best models, um, let me know, because I would like to replace this with a Leatherman that doesn't fall apart. Uh, and, uh, you know, like I said, I'm not trying to dish on the whole brand. I know they're an excellent, very, very trusted brand, but I was just kind of shocked that without like hardly ever ever using this thing i pull it out and it just goes ugh, ugh, just sort of fell apart and i'm wondering is it neglect do these things have hearts and souls was it was it broken by my by neglect or um you know did i get a lemon probably just got a lemon uh but uh so let me know uh, you can either call the listener line or, or or leave a comment below um is there a certain Leatherman I should look for when I replace this. I definitely want something that has a lot of tools. The one thing that attracted me to this, uh, the surge was this uh, excellent, see, it's hard to, I don't even know if I can close it all the way anymore, uh, but this excellent uh, blade, which now is hard to take out, but it's a one-handed locking blade. Uh, nice blade, got to say, very sharp. And it's not chisel ground like some of their other uh, less expensive ones. Not that I mind that, but... Uh, uh, I thought that this thing was was the ticket, um, and now uh, I, something's gone wrong. So please let me know, is there a Leatherman that you recommend? Uh, I know there are a lot of models. It's kind of like, it's kind of like approaching uh, Victorinox or the Swiss Army Knives. Which one do I get? There's so many of them. There's so many tools and this and that. But uh, if you have one that is really stout-hearted, that has uh, never failed you, let me know which one that is, and I think I will go and buy it um, because this one has bitten the dust and I and I don't feel I don't feel safe 
uh, with it. So I'm going to do something with it. I don't know. It'll probably just hang out right here in this room and uh, get used on occasion if, I, if I'm too lazy to walk over there and get a pair of pliers to be honest. Okay, so uh, moving on, a good buddy of mine from work uh, was going through the effects, uh, personal effects of his father uh, upon his passing and found some knives and he brought them in and they're pretty cool. I'm going to show three of them, but focus on one of them. Uh, the first one is a, you know, most definitely a tourist piece. It's by Imperial. And uh, I just found this interesting because it's, it's, uh, you can tell it's very inexpensive. It's early plastic here on the handle, um, made to look like stag. You can see there's a moose or an elk, I mean, an elk uh, sort of carved into the, or molded into the plastic. This handle is uh, screwed on there, bolted, pinned on there, sorry. And you can see that it's a full tang, um, partially anyway, down to about here. And, uh, but the, the reason I wanted to show this off is that you can tell it's a cheap knife, but it's still razor sharp. I mean, this thing is very sharp. So it just, it just, uh, gave me that feeling of sometimes I get the feeling like, wow, they, they really did things better back in the day. They, they paid a little bit more attention to everything. And, uh, and, um, in terms of quality, in terms of getting, quality for what you pay for it. This is a thin and, you know, let's just say it's kind of a cheap touristy knife, but it's still, they said it's a knife, so it still has to be very sharp and it is very sharp. So I was impressed by that. Uh, it's got one of those sheaths where it, it had another knife in there at one point on the front. Uh, not, not my favorite design thing. And, uh, and you can see that the, the stitching has split here, but, uh, so there's that. This next one is very interesting because I've never really seen anything like it. It is a giant folder for, you know, and it's not a cold steel, <laughs> but look at this thing. It's, it's, it's about six inches long. And then when you open the blade, it's got a blade and a saw and the blade <sighs> locks open with a liner lock and it's huge. And uh, I can see a bit of dried up 50 year old viscera still on the blade. I have not cleaned this thing up. I think this was used for hunting or fishing because there's some very obviously organic material uh, on the blade still. Um, but still, again, this giant clip point blade is razor sharp. Um, I suspect my friend's father sharpened it and knew how to sharpen it and kept it sharp, but it very obviously got used. There's a chip in the tip of the blade and uh, so you can tell it was really used, but it's very sharp. I'm impressed by that. You say, Bob, it's a knife. It should be sharp. And I know that. But um, after aging this long and, and being road hard and put away wet, it's still uh, very, very sharp. Now, it also has a saw. Maybe it's a bone saw. I'm not sure. Um, I may or may not be able to open this on. Yeah, okay. So that's about, ah, yeah, look at that. Look at this thing. I've never seen a folder this big, uh, you know, pre-cold steel giant folders. I've seen large four-inch case fisher, uh, fishing knives and stuff like that, the large toothpicks that they turn into fisherman knives with the, with the extra blade that's a scaler and deboner. But this thing, man, just never seen anything like it. It's very interesting. And I cannot make out any markings on it. So if you have any idea what this is, I would be very interested. Something about it looks K-bar-ish. Maybe it's this sort of a handle with the, um, it's a knurled plastic handle with little grooves in the side, kind of like a, a uh, K-bar, but you can see like all this like fish guts and stuff stuck in there. And, and it looks like this saw blade can be removed and replaced. You see that? I'm not quite sure how you would do it, but uh, the saw blade itself looks sandwiched into a two-piece tang there, unlike the blade, which is just a, a solid blade in there. Now, every time I've picked this up and manipulated, I'm not even going to attempt to close this on camera. Um, every time I've picked it up, my hands, I, I want to wash them 
and I don't have any hand sanitizer around me, so I'm going to continue dirty here. But uh, yeah, this knife was, uh, <laughs> it looks like they uh, got a couple of fish, maybe skinned a bar and then folded it up without cleaning it, put it away for 50 years. He said all of these knives are at least 50 years old. So interesting. Now, the last one I, I have cleaned up a little bit and it's this, it's a German knife from Solingen and uh, it's a Baron brand tried to do, did, uh, attempted some research on this and really wasn't finding much. Um, there were a lot of different brands uh, in Solingen, Solingen, Germany, and uh, was finding some old, like on eBay and Etsy, finding some old kitchen knives, like carving knives with the name Baron, but I didn't find any, any knife any knives like this. This is a clip point, looks like a hunting knife, just an outdoors knife. And I cleaned it up. I put some flits on the blade. It wasn't too bad. Uh, so I just polished it up a little. I put some, um, uh, what do you call it? Oh, red wing boot cream on the, on the handles. As you can see, it's a stacked leather handle and the, and the leather pieces are very thin, thinner than I'm used to seeing. And if you look at this beautiful pommel, it's a little bit loose. You need a special spanner wrench to tighten that. Um, it's a little bit loose. And I think that's because uh, the uh, pieces of leather have shrunk over the years as they've sort of desiccated. And uh, so hopefully that cream in there, it's, it's definitely perked up the leather a little bit, but hopefully uh, this fattens up a little bit. Uh, maybe I'll put some oil in there too. And, um, who knows? Maybe it'll tighten up the pommel a little bit. Maybe you're laughing at that. I don't know. I don't know if it's a, if that's a real thing or not. Uh, right here on the spine, you can see it's crowned, so it's nicely rounded. You have a, um, a fuller there for weight reduction. It, it is not a blood gutter or a blood groove. It is not there so that when you thrust it into something, the blood has a place to flow out. That's a myth. It is uh, Fullers are, are there for rigidity. Uh, and also they're there to lighten, lighten the blade. The reason this knife really jumped out at me is because recently I got the Boone 2 by Bark River Knives. And, and uh, for a couple of weeks there, I was going on and on about how it's like the classic belt knife that you would expect anyone walking around in the outdoors in, in days gone by to have on them. Uh, multi-purpose, you know, hunting knife, camping knife, and, um, you know, in a pinch fighting knife. I think this looks a bit like a proto K bar. And so when my friend handed me this, it immediately made me think, you know, this, this Baron, uh, German Baron knife, it immediately made me think of the Boone too. And, uh, you know, that whole sort of nostalgic thing that the Boone too brought up in me, uh, this Baron knife really uh, was the real example of. So I could just see my friend's father, you know, 50 years ago or whatever, walking around with this on his hip at the campsite. And this was just the knife. You know, you go camping and you bring this knife and it lives on your hip until you're done and you come back to civilization or whatever. So uh, I know that this is an, an heirloom and, a, and something that uh, my friend will value uh, but man, I'd love to have something just like it. Uh, oh, I guess I kind of do in the Boone too. But, but this has history built into it. It has a, a, a real history that lives in the knife itself. And someday I'll hand down the Boone too to my daughters and, and say, remember the time I was cutting the lawn and I had this on me? Well, it has a soul now, girls, and I want you to carry it on. So thank you, Greg, for the loners. Uh, I appreciate it, especially this uh, Baron. I will do what I can to find out about it. The The disappointing thing is how cheesy the che the sheaths were back in the day. Look at it. Look at this thin uh, this thin leather uh, is riveted and sewn. I'll, I'll try and clean this up as well. And they're smart enough to put this uh, leather, I mean, this metal, what is this called? Chape, I think it's called, or ferrule or something. Uh, at the bottom, so you don't stab through it, you know, when you sit down in your Jeep or something. Uh, but I wish, I wish these old knives came with more stout and sturdy sheaths like this, thisy here, uh, Bark River Knives sheath. 
but a uh, little little piece of history on the desk today and uh, I'm very happy to have been able to check it out and clean up this knife uh, the next the next thing we'll be trying to figure out that big folder what is it where is it from uh, how the how do I clean it um, how much should I clean because like I said there's so much history into it you know already built into it you don't want to kind of just erase that so Anyway, that's what you have. Speaking of knives on loan, our good friend Justin at Tier 1 Gear Reviews has loaned me a, uh, a couple of buttes. Uh, last week, I showed off uh, uh, three knives, one made by Jake B. Creates, and then another uh, two made by Sad Devil or Sad Evil. And uh, this week, I want to show off a couple of others. He sent he sent seven knives in total, and hey, I really appreciate it. Uh, that's putting a lot of trust into someone that you've never met in person. So I really appreciate that. The first is a Bark River knife, designed by Chris Tanner. You know him as um, the guy with the channel um, Prepared Mind One Hundred and One. I've been watching him for years and years. He's an Ohio boy, and. Uh, and I appreciate his love of fixed blade knives. So he has designed a number of knives. I think the first one he made, the the uh, the Jessica Jessica X, I think it was called, was made by Schrade. It was this giant wood processing camp knife with a huge handle. Very very uh, unique looking knife. Uh, and then he, as his design sense was refined more and more, he's had a number of knives made with uh, through Bark River knives and. We all know Bark River Knives makes excellent, excellent things. And this is one of them. This is the JX6 Companion Knife. And it comes in this beautiful leather sheath. Uh, I always love Bark, Bark River's leather. And this is the knife. Beautiful, full-bellied um, fixed blade knife. I mean, it is 100% belly. And... Uh, the blade is that is and if you look at it it could be a clip point or it could be a sax style knife except that it's got that belly so i, I guess we're going to call this a clip point uh, but it really fits the hand perfectly um, and i remember in seeing him talking about the design he wanted um he wanted this to be a bit of a an edc knife and a, and a bit of a companion knife something very easy to carry but fixed so that if you have hard work to do, but you don't need a big knife, uh, you'll still have it on you. You know, the knife is only valuable if you have it on you. So that area right here where the handle meets the blade, the sort of Ricasso area, was a special consideration for him. He wanted the blade, to, he wanted it, essentially this ends up being a 50-50 choil, like you see in, in, a, uh, in a Spyderco, say, where, in this area where the where the forefinger goes, it's half blade and half handle. That allows you to have a full size handle there with a full grip, but it's not taking up too much room uh, and not protruding too far off the blade, so that it's a uh, uh, handle heavy. You you get to maintain a pretty decent blade to handle ratio. I'm going to wipe this off. I know that Chris did not intend this to be so, but I think that this would be an excellent. Uh, fighting self-defense tactical knife because of how it allows you to grip and put your thumb way up front. And then you have all of that slicing, accelerated slicing from that, from that belly. And uh, at the same time, you have a center line point. So you could use that point to great effect. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm attracted to this visually, but having had it in hand, it's a really quite a nice knife and a great design from a non knife maker. You know, he's a, He's a user. He's a guy who goes out and camps and and tests, thrashes on fixed blade knives, and he came up with a hell of a design. I, I really like it. And uh, not for nothing, I like those kind of cattywampusly placed cattywampusly. That's a that's a new adverb. Uh, placed um, uh, pins here, and they're hollow pins, so you can uh, put lanyards through them in in a number of different. Uh, configurations. I, I, for one, like the idea of having a lanyard that goes from from this front loop to this back loop, and like a D guard, kind of goes over your hand here, over the back of your hand, in case you're using it a lot and you need to 
uh, loosen your grip to do something with your fingers. You don't have to put it down or put it in the sheath. It can kind of, with a lanyard, stay attached to your hand while you do other things. So I like the uh, I like the lanyard placements, so lanyard loop placements slash pins. This, like uh, all other Bark River knives, comes in a number of different handle materials. And I was just at, not Knives Ship Free, I was there too, but I was uh, looking at DLT Trading. They have a number of these still in, in, um, in stock. This version is in LMAX steel, uh, a, a highly trusted uh, steel that I don't have too much experience with, but look at that, that's a beautiful knife. And then when you look at the relief edge, I mean the, um, the main bevel and the relief edge, it is a um, convex grind. Like all of Bark River knives, it's a convex grind, which makes the blade very, very sharp, but also very robust when you're, when you're powering it through wood and other hard materials. Um, so very, uh, very impressed with this uh, Bark River Knives JS6 designed by Chris Tanner of Prepared Mind 101 um, on YouTube. He seems like a cool guy. I'd like to have him on the show. I've reached out to him. Haven't heard back from him, but that'll change. I'll get him on here. I'd love to find out uh, his progress in going from just a knife appreciator and user to a designer. Great knife, Bark River. And then uh, fits beautifully in this uh, nicely, nicely waterproofed sheath. Now you can tell uh, with when when you order a Bark River knife, they offer it in raw leather, and that's what this looks like. This is raw leather, or they'll waterproof it. And when they waterproof it, it ends up looking like this. So good thing to have uh, the waterproof, especially uh, especially if you're uh, using a, a high carbon steel. The next knife on loan from, from Tier 1 is also a Bark River knife. And you look at it here, and you think, Karambit? And they do make a Karambit, but this is not a Karambit. This is a bird and trout knife, and they call this one the ringtail. A bird and trout knife, uh, the signature design of a bird and trout knife is a small blade, small, um, small blade for... Um, uh, skinning and dressing out birds and fish, you know, whether you're fishing or hunting. And then they have a long slender handle like this, and then a ring at the end. And what that allows you to do is um, do your skinning or your dressing of game, of small game. And then if you need to, you can dangle it from your pinky while you do other stuff with your hands instead of having to resheathe it and then you can just bring it back into your hand and use it, use it, use it, and then let it dangle again so you can do other work. So, uh, yes, you could you could use this like a karambit. And as a matter of fact, I like how they place the ring offset from the center line of the handle. That actually would allow for uh, karambit style manipulations and such, and also allows you to have a fist without having um, without having the blade. Uh, kind of coming out at this weird angle, which is what happens when you just plop uh, a ring at the very top symmetrically, you know, in line with the with the handle. Uh, if you look at the cold steel uh, bird and trout, it's that is kind of a more center line loop and would make it more difficult to do karambit style things with it. Uh, that being said, you're probably not going to want to do that with this anyway. It's not intended for that. Beautiful Bark River construction. This one has the black linen micarta with grooves. You don't too often see them texturing the handles like that. But since uh, fish are slippery and birds bleed, I guess uh, <laughs> you want some some more texture on that on that uh, handle. It also just looks nice. And then you have those beautiful red liners. This is a stainless steel also, 154 cm, which is a bit uh, out of their um, their norm, their norm, they, they usually run, what, a 01 to tool steel, I think, on a lot of their knives. And like the other knife we were looking at, the JS6, this is a convex grind. Very, very sharp. Great little knife. I love these. I love these bark rivers. I love getting my hands on bark rivers. I have a, a few of them, five, four or five of them, and I, I really love them. Uh, but they are not inexpensive. So, 
um, it's nice to get a chance to hold, you know, hold and experience them without having to, to buy them. This is the ringtail. And this is something they do pretty cool with their sheaths on smaller knives like this. You could wear this as a neck knife. Well, back here on the back of the sheath, you, you can see that they cut this for scout style carry on your belt or regular north to south carry on your belt. But also, you could loop a uh, paracord through there, some paracord, and hang it upside down because on a lot of their smaller sheaths, they put a magnet in there to hold on to the blade. So, you know, it's, as you can see right here, the knife is, the blade is stuck to the bottom of the sheath uh, without anything but the magic of magnets. Um, so you could run this upside down around your neck and pretty confidently know it's not going to fall out. Now, without a mechanical connection, without something like a strap holding it in, I wouldn't do that probably. Uh, but the knife is light enough that if you shake it with the magnet engaging the blade, it's not going to come out. So maybe I would run it upside down like that. It is a pretty strong magnet. So that's the Bark River Ringtail Fish and Trout Knife or uh, Bird and Trout Knife. And it's another impressive, uh, impressive knife from Bark River. The next two are from a custom knife maker who's been on the show before, Ryan Pearson. He was on episode 168 and uh, an interesting guy who uh, forges all of his knives. And um, Tier 1 is a big fan of him. I've experienced a couple of other Pearson knives through through him and uh, I'm excited to show these off. This first one is in a Bark River sheath. This is not the sheath that came with it. I believe Pearson only does um, Kydex sheaths, but this is a beaut. This, I, I believe this model is called the Rambler and uh, it is just gorgeous. First thing you see when you look at this is the, the fat carbon fiber. You know, I'm not a huge carbon fiber guy, but I love fat carbon fiber. And what I like about it is it's not that regular weave sort of uh, affair that you get that you were getting from that you get from standard carbon fiber. Let me just put it that way. Look at this. It's just beautiful. You can see he used some G10 pins there. I like that, too. They sort of just blend in there. You can see his maker's mark on the spine. I always like a maker's mark on the spine because it keeps the uh, the blade free from uh, billboarding and such. And uh, man alive, that jimping is awesome. You can tell uh, that, that was done with a jimping file, I'm pretty sure. And uh, it's pretty even and works great. This is a nice little knife. Uh, I got to say, you get a full handled grip on it. Nice little uh, uh, Coke bottle shape. And uh, that tumbled finish is really, really nice. Each one is handmade. Each one is forged. And uh, each so each one is slightly different. But he has um, models that are, uh, that are uniform, you know. Um, so you'll see this Rambler. If you go to his Instagram page, you'll see this model. Uh, in a couple of different styles. they The blades might be a little bit longer or a little bit shorter or what have you, but but they're all ramblers and uh, look just looks like a great small hunting knife, outdoors knife. You should check out Ryan Pearson. Uh, I don't believe he has a website yet, but he's got a, a thriving Facebook group and uh, an Instagram page where he shows these things off. Beautifully done. And I got to say, I, I approve slash applaud the use of this leather sheath with this knife. To me, a fine knife like this should be in leather. And uh, so thank you for letting me uh, borrow this. I mean, it's really nice that that uh, he's loaning me these gorgeous uh, custom blades, uh, tier one that is. Uh, and then here we have the last one I'm going to show is also a Pearson knife. This is what his sheaths look like. Set up for scout carry here. Kydex. You got red on one side, black, carbon fibery on the back. I say carbon fibery because I'm not sure if that's carbon fiber or just Kydex made to look like it. But also with a beautiful, unique carbon fiber handle. 
with the G10 pins. And then look at this beautiful Damascus. So as I mentioned before, Ryan forges his knives, and I'm not sure if he made this Damascus. I can only assume that he did. And it is beautiful and way, way super sharp. This model he calls the Titan. And this one I've seen in uh, slightly larger blades as well. Again, you have that really sumptuously contoured handle. It just feels so good in hand, and it really looks great too with that irregular pattern there. And it matches the um, Damascus steel quite well. They, they uh, no Mr. Furley issues here. I feel like these two different patterns really go nicely together. Got a lanyard hole. And I gotta say, and then his maker's mark on the back here, having these knives in hand and being exposed to more and more handmade custom knives has really gotten me, uh, wet my appetite for more unique, more custom knives. And um, if you're a fixed blade lover, which I am, you can very affordably get yourself behind the wheel of a fixed blade custom knife. And uh, so I, I feel myself moving in that direction more and more. Um, these knives are not super expensive. Uh, I recently had... Uh, um, uh, BMG knives on and his, his small EDC fixed blades are also quite affordable. And so I ordered one and I'm going to order some more, you know, uh, I'm going to get something from Pearson. I'm going to get something from sad evil. I'm going to get something from Jake B creates because they're making and spending a lot of time and attention on these beautifully made custom knives. And just because they're fixed blades and there's a, there's less, mechanics and physics and such that goes into the making of them, they cost less. And uh, it's a great way to experience something handmade. It's a great way to have something that is totally unique. And it's also a great way to help support an industry that can always use the support. It's great to, to buy uh, production knives, of course, but also it's also good to take a look at who is hand making these unique knives and also making them in a, in a way that's affordable. So that's what I'm going to start doing more and more of. Um, so thank you, Justin, for loaning me these knives. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, check out tier one gear reviews, uh, EDC reviews on YouTube. Uh, great stuff up there and uh, a great guy. I, I really appreciate the trust folks like him uh, put in me to you know, loan these knives to me to let me check them out. And plus, it helps the community because it's really hard for me to like a knife and then not go out and buy a knife. So uh, the more you loan me, the more I go out and buy. Hmm, that's an equation I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think I need to work on that a little bit. Anyway, I think that about does it for this edition of the Knife Junkie uh, midweek supplemental. This is episode number 215. It's kind of fun to say, episode 215. Uh, join us tomorrow night, Thursday Night Knives. It's our live stream, as I mentioned earlier, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, on YouTube. Join the conversation, comment. It's so great. It's just a steady flow of comments. Uh, and, and a lot of the same characters show up and a lot of new people each week. And uh, I'm starting to feel like I, I'm getting to know a lot of you. And I love that. But another great way to get to know you is if you go to the knifejunkie.com slash join, and then you can actually come on the show and show off your knives. You know, we have a lot of that. And uh, it's it's great fun. Uh, also, please join us for another great interview. We have uh, Chuck Gidritis coming up, a custom switchblade maker, automatic knife maker, among other things, but that's what I really, uh, really resonate with. And uh, well, every Sunday, uh, an interview with another great knife personality, someone in the knife world making the knife world happen. That's what we're all about here. So for Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'd like to say thanks for tuning in. I'm Bob DeMarco, and we'll see you here next time. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com.
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.